Chris, you have great hair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for uh, willing to do this. Yeah. Yeah, I saw you were going to do it then. I liked it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And then I think you said you were going to read Steve Staley. Yeah, that was quite a while ago. Yeah, that was, I just had lunch with him yesterday. So, okay. So, my first, uh, like, in person hangouts, like, in forever. So, I know that you went to a uh, University of Arizona and then Erica Schaefer got you into a uh, anime. Yeah. Yeah. She did. Um, yeah. She was a grad student. I was an undergrad and the project was Nazca. Yeah. Blades of Fate. And I think this was in like 1999, 2000, maybe. So it was my first dubbing job ever. And it was also the producer's first dubbing job at the studio or maybe first dubbing job too is new generation pictures so and Taliesin Jaffe was the one who was directing right and I first time meeting all these guys and so we didn't there's no digital stuff going on so it was tapes and there were no beats to lead you into it so everything was eyeballed like you know I would just they would just play it and then I would look and after watching it a few times, just know when to go. And um, I guess, you know, Talison was like, I can't believe you've never done this before. And I guess I had a little bit of a knack for it, but it was a lot easier back then because things went so much slower. Mm -hmm. You know, there was more time on the engineering side for them to set things up. So you had a little more time to process stuff. Now, you know, with technology, it's, you get so much more done in you know two to four hours than you did back then so it's it's changed like exponentially since i first started mm -hmm. how did you uh, personally take to dubbing then at first at first yeah I, I just felt like i had a knack for it and also since it was my first time dubbing they would give me the tapes ahead of time on vhs <laughs> And I would watch it like, uh, you know, the night before. And I don't even think it was uh, captured. You know, there was no subtitles. It was just, uh, so I just watched Japanese and I would have the script and I would kind of look at it the night before to get a feel for what was going on. So I also had that going for me. Whereas now it's, you know, sometimes I don't even know what I'm working on and, you know, you don't know what you're doing until you till right before so there's a lot more trust uh with the director in terms of them just giving you the guidance because you a lot of times like if your director doesn't want to tell you the context because they don't think it's necessary you know they don't tell you anything they're just like okay you're really mad right now or <laughs> or something like that you just kind of have to go with it mm -hmm. i don't know if the credit was right but um even prior to that, was it true that you were a PA on as uh, as good as it gets? Yeah, that was my first job. I moved, well, not my first job. I think it was my second job when I moved to LA. My first job was on Power Rangers Okay. as a PA. And then I worked on as good as it gets. Yeah. So that dates me. But yeah, I was like, right. <laughs> I was right after I moved to LA and it was the year of El Nino, mm -hmm. which was just a lot of rainstorms. And I remember like as a PA, like, you know, you, you have to run stuff down to the stage and back to the office and the lot would be flooded. So I'd be like higher than ankle deep in water in some points, like going back and forth to the stage, you know, but it was, um, it was interesting. I think that's kind of when I decided that uh, movies weren't anything as like a PA I wanted to continue to work in. Mm -hmm. Just because there was a lot of, um, I mean, granted, this is probably a little bit of an extreme because it was Academy Award winning film and stuff. But, you know, there was so much importance put on things like making sure the, the soft drinks were cold enough when people went in to watch the dailies, which is like the footage they shot the day before. And it got to be something where like 30 people would go, um, you know, so you're always getting pressure put on you for the most smallest things. And I was like, this isn't, this isn't for me. Like, I want to work somewhere where there's a little more like, people are a little more real, I guess. And not like, 
I'm like, I'm like 30 seconds in, I'm already like kind of bashing the industry, but in the sense of like, there's a lot of like self-importance sometimes the higher up you go with, with features and things like that. It's less so now than it was, I think back when I first started, but you know, you just have all this kind of pressure on you for minutia for people who, you know, uh, who are they're just people just like you and me. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but it was a good experience. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, even considering that, I did think it was interesting that you didn't, no, uh, you didn't get until you didn't get into, into SAG until you did uh, Angel Tales. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was uh, well because yeah, because dubbing just was never, and it still isn't really. There's not a lot of union projects. Some are and some aren't, mm-hmm. but I would say by and large, at least like eighty to ninety percent are probably non-union. And then after they've gone for so long, you see they'll they'll go like I know Naruto. When I worked on it, towards the very end, it was union, but I think it was non-union when it first started years ago. That being said, like the union dubbing rate hasn't changed. Like when I started, so whenever that was like 99, 2000, the non-union dubbing rate was $75 an hour with a two-hour minimum. And um, the non-union dubbing rate was sixty-eight twenty-five an hour with a two-hour minimum. And then you get you know, money towards health and pension and that kind of stuff and bumps or something like that if you do more voices. Like neither of those rates have changed um, until like this year mm-hmm. or last year. So there was never any like increase for inflation or cost of living or anything like that. So the, the union rate was so low. It's, it's kind of funny that people were shying away from it, but there's additional costs, you know, on the back end. So, yeah, but now like there's a Netflix dubbing agreement that's much better than, 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 the, than the SAG dubbing agreement. And I know SAG is working on the dubbing agreement. I don't think anything's 100% solidified yet. I think they're bargaining about it. Um, but hopefully we'll get up to something that actors can make uh, a little more of a, a living doing it because actors, you know, it's a gig-based job. There's no guarantee, you know, every, Steve Staley says the best. Every audition is like a lottery ticket Mm -hmm. and uh, you scratch it off. And if you get cast, you won. And then uh, you find out how much money you've won (laughs) later on. You know, it could be a radio job that pays you $4.95 plus 10 or that same radio job that could wind up doing a bunch of buyouts and you wind up getting like $3,500 from it. You you just never know. And that's sort of where residuals and all those things came into play is because that way actors could afford to full-time focusing on their acting as opposed to taking a second or third jobs trying to sustain their income when they're waiting for the next acting job to come along um it's definitely a, a necessary thing i guess if you if people want to have a career in acting you need uh sort of a profit sharing or residual based structure to kind of de- help carry you along otherwise actors are going to get other jobs that will conflict and they won't be available mm-hmm. so yeah that sounds like Based off what I saw, are you still kind of doing uh, script supervision work and PA work? That, not PA work, but uh, I do. I joined the DGA. So I'm in the DGA as an associate director, Mm -hmm. uh, which is probably something I could have done years ago, but I didn't want to make that investment for um, and get myself into another gilded cage. Kind of what took me so long to sort of treat voice acting as a full-time career versus something I was doing in addition to working in production was the fact that I was making a lot of money. And uh, it's easy to do like, you know, I was, I was happy doing, um, you know, I dubbed certain projects part-time when they came up and then, um, you know, and then I had like my main source of income. But after a while for me, it, it just got, um, you know, the hours in production got really long and, um, it was just something I just didn't want to do anymore. It wasn't for me. So I pretty much never do any script jobs unless I know it's like maybe towards the end or the beginning of the year and I know nothing's going to be coming up. Maybe I'll do one. But um, for the most part, I will just day play. Like if I get a job and it's just for a day and I might get an AD or, or take edit notes or something like that, I'll be back because then it's easy to schedule around. Um, whereas if I 
we're going to do a script job. You'd have to commit to like three or four weeks on something. And then that just kind of causes strife with your agents. Yeah. A lot of people I think do have other jobs, but the jobs are also kind of flexible. So you kind of can schedule around your acting work. Mm-hmm. And so going back to the timeline of roles, would um, Strawberry Eggs be after Nazca? I think actually I may have done uh, The Amazing Nurse Nanako. Oh, right. Before Strawberry Eggs. And that was all at the same place. And then Strawberry Eggs, and it was directed by Crispin. I know, I remember like at that post facility, which is gone now, I did Nazca, Strawberry Eggs, Nurse Nanako, and I did like a couple of voices on um, ROD, the TV. Right. Yeah. And that just happened. I was coming in to pick up a paycheck and Talison was there and he was like, what are you doing here? And I was like, I'm just getting a paycheck. He's like, come here real quick. I have some extra voices you can do. So, so I went in there and did them. So mm-hmm. I'm not even sure like who I was at this point. It was like teachers or random things like that, I think. Mm-hmm. But those are the nice little surprises about acting. You kind of get random jobs sometimes just by showing up. Mm-hmm. And nobody ever talks about a Melody of Oblivion, but that's a, that's a really cool show. I know. It was... Um, I really liked that show. I know the original Japanese was... A female did the voice of the male character. I liked it, and it was really weird and dark. Um, I think Erica was in that, too. I think it was like the last thing I think I worked in that I saw heard Erica's voice. Um, yeah, and it just kind of like was one of those ones that kind of like came out and I thought it was going to get pretty well received. And then it just kind of like, you know, not as much happened as I was expecting, which that happens a lot. Like you get on a project and you're like, oh, wow, this is going to be great. Like when I was uh, Mega Man X and Marvel versus Capcom, I was like, you know, I'm going to be the, you know, the voice of this character I've known since I was like a kid and people are excited about coming back and the game did okay, but I think not as okay as, uh, as I was, I was hoping. And a few other actors, we talked about it and we're like, this is going to be it. like, cause every job's a lottery ticket. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know, this could be a job that's going to totally launch my career and then, uh, or give it a boost. And it was like, it was a, it was another credit. It was good. I'm, I'm thrilled that I got to be the voice of X. Um, and I'm really proud of it, but those are kind of the risks you take, you know, when you're acting, it's like, you could be a voice in a game and it could be a huge hit, like, um, like three houses, mm-hmm. big game, you know, everyone loves it. And, and um, or you could do a game and it's just kind of like, it gets, comes out and it does okay, but you know, doesn't do as well as the people making it hoped. Mm-hmm. Well, I can say yeah, when I made the post fielding for questions for you in the Fire Emblem subreddit, like it blew up more than a lot of interviews I've done for it. So there's a huge fan base for your performances. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> I love Fire Emblem Heroes is probably my favorite game. I play it on my iPad daily. Okay. I've, I've even told them when I've gone into sessions, I'm like, when I booked Keaton, which was a voice match, you know, th- those sessions are, are really fun as an actor's perspective because you go in and you're there for maybe 30 minutes, you know, because you have like maybe 10, 10 lines and nothing is matching. So you just go in and you experiment and you have fun and everyone has a good time and you leave. And, and um, so when I booked it, I immediately downloaded the game and started messing with it just so I kind of knew do about the game and you know what the job is going to be like that kind of stuff and I just kind of got hooked and then when my character dropped ego kind of got in there so of course I had to like play Keaton and then another Keaton came up and the Fire Emblem fans are so nice uh you know I've only gotten positive feedback like when I see myself mentioned and there are so many other things like where you do stuff and people you know people like to complain more than they like to give praise especially like if they're having a bad day or you know whatever and as an actor you kind of can't take it personal either way obviously you want people to like what you're doing but in one sense of it i'm such a small part mm-hmm. like i you know i'm bringing a character to life but that is the character that was written 
by someone else and I'm being directed by someone else and the client certainly has their, their perception of how this character needs to be perceived. So although a lot of it kind of falls on the actor because you're the face of the character or the voice, a lot of those decisions just aren't under your control. And, you know, bottom line is that when I, when I train people, or train when I coach people, you know, you, you learn how to act and you kind of develop a craft that works for you. But ultimately when you get a job, it's just to kind of go in and do what you're told. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously like you're auditioning kind of, okay, yeah, we really like where this guy's going and it's, and it is collaborative, but you know, sessions in a way, you know, that's a lot of money's being spent. They want to make the most out of their time. And ultimately like the director is going to be like, this is what we want. And then you do it. And then if it's what they want, they say, great. And if it's not, they give you another, they give you a redirect. So Sometimes I feel bad when people get a lot of negative feedback online for something. Cause I know having done it, it's like, you know, it's not, it's not, it's out of your control mm-hmm. and every actor, like they're not going to say no to a job. You know, like if someone has problems with casting, that's not the actor's fault. You know, the actor submitted for the job just like everybody else did and they were chosen mm-hmm. and they were excited to do it. They did their best. But then, you know, when you hear people like complain about so-and-so, they didn't like that this, this person voiced this role or, or, you know, like even in film and TV, you know, when you say people complain about casting and that, you know, has nothing to do with the actor. You know, the actor was just as excited about it as the fans and they did their best, but you know, what are you going to do? I think that's one thing that sets uh, when you know you want to do acting is when you do something and you do your best and then it's not well received for, you know, whatever reason but that doesn't stop you from continuing to act, mm-hmm. you know? Um, Cause that part of it can be a little rough. Like I remember when Dan Hibiki first came out in four, there was a little bit of like a, a thing where, you know, there was links and some people were like, this guy sucks. He doesn't sound like Dan. And, and then other people were like, I think he's good. You know, it was just back and forth. And the thing was like, I didn't even know I was Dan until mm-hmm. like I was, in the booth, like I, you know, auditioned for a part in a game that I didn't even know the name of. And then they're like, hey, we're going to cast you in this character. Great. And I go in and they like show me the picture. And I'm like, you want my voice to come out of this guy's body? Like, <laughs> I was like, he's huge. And they're like, yeah. And I was like, okay. And I, I was like, you know, so I'm going to be Dan. And then it, actually, I didn't know as much about Dan. Like, I knew the character, but I didn't really know a lot of his history and like the fact that he was a, you know, a joke character and his gi was pink because he put it in, you know, with his red clothes, like all that stuff I kind of learned um, when I was recording it. Like I just knew he was a character in Street Fighter, but I wasn't, um, it was one of those games that like I played casually, but I didn't get into the, uh, you know, the the lore of it because I'm not good at video games. Oh. <laughs> so so it's like one of those ones where I'll play it for a while and then I just get you know just trounced by whoever I'm playing with Mm -hmm. and then you know I go on so I get discouraged and I stop but well in terms of uh, yeah well in terms of your larger more central characters who do you think that you um relate the most to that's a good question I mean like the parts about me that like um sort of resonate with me about certain characters, I can tell you, like, you know, X and his sort of feeling of responsibility and, um, you know, his stoicism and how he really, you know, wants things to be peaceful and he kind of reluctantly battles the, sort of the responsibility and the Boy Scoutness of X I can relate to. Dan Hibiki is that sort of inner blowhard who is overcompensating for his inner insecurities. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we all, I don't know, maybe I can't speak for everybody, but certainly when I was younger, that was totally me, like, you know, I'm totally insecure about everything. And so you grandstand and, and, and it'd be funny to kind of compensate for that. And Keaton, <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> he's, uh, I was going to say, well, I mean, just by and large, because he's a wolf skin, there's not, you know. Uh, I mean, there are certain things that I certainly, I think Keaton finds the joy in a lot of little things. Um, I do not have a habit of collecting a lot of things. So that is not in my personality. 
Um, I'm someone who kind of is constantly getting rid of stuff that I don't need to kind of streamline my life. I just kind of feel like too many things get distracting. And I mean, I think this is, is like where it all comes in. Like it, when you're playing Fire Emblem Heroes, like just the animation still to this day crack me up. You know, like how Keaton like does something, he like punches his fists and he, you know, does all this kind of stuff. And how he kind of like winds up his fist. Like there's so many like cute things that he does that also I think, you know, coincide like with the performance I'm putting, which I didn't even know that's how it was going to look, but that was, you know, in part from the direction I got from the client and from the director that I think it kind of is a nice perfect storm where it kind of became a good character. That being said, I think Keaton is someone who is always in the moment mm -hmm. um, and doesn't really think a lot about the past or the future. Now, granted, I did not play the original Fire Emblem game that he was in. So I don't know, I didn't play for that game, so I don't kind of know all the nuances about it. I just know what I read um, and then how I kind of perceive in this game. So that part of me is definitely in there. Like, you know, I guess all, all animals are kind of like that in the sense, like dogs, like they're very present. Dogs don't really worry about the past or the future. They just kind of focus on the here and now. But also he's, he's, he's very, um, he gets very excited about little things. And I think that's something I do too. I'm like someone who gets really into novelty. Like if something is new, I don't know if you're like this, but like I saw Fruity Pebbles ice cream the other day. And I was like, I have to buy this mm -hmm. because it's Fruity Pebbles ice cream. So I get really excited about random stuff like that. I will say Keaton's probably the dearest to my heart just because it has so many fans. And I'm so relieved that so many people contact me saying that they enjoy the character and playing the character. And that's always something that's good to hear because that's that's ultimately what you know we're all here for is I'm here to give something to people who play it and, and for them to have a good time. That's what everybody wants. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Do you have you probably have more affinity with Keaton over Shannon then? Or is it kind of equal? Uh it's kind of equal. Shannon's Shannon is someone who they brought me in, and so I only knew what they told me in the session. You know, so he also is someone who is very stoic and I kind of got like his someone who has a tremendous sense of responsibility. He he failed at a few things and he feels like he's doing penance for it. Like these are all just things I got thrown at me in the 30 minutes I had to do the recording. Um, so sort of what I put together with that was like, this is someone who uh, has kind of very protective big brother inclinations. Uh, I think he, and I, and like I said, like when I was told about this version of Fire Emblem, was this ever dubbed in English, this original game? Cause I don't think it was, or was it? Yeah. So, um, cause they said, yeah, it's not, you're not voice matching anybody. This one never got dubbed in English, but this is kind of how it was like. So how I translated that in my head was, you know, I'm like, well, this guy sounds like somebody who takes a lot of responsibility, not only for himself, but for other people and the protection of other people. Yeah, I, I have a lot of big brother tendencies in general. Like, uh, you know, I, I am an older brother, but like when I meet people who um, are less experienced than me or younger than me, you know, like I will, and they're starting out, I have a tendency to kind of mentor them as much as they're willing to let me and be like, hey, you know, don't do it this way because it'll waste your time. Like do it this way. And, and so I have a tendency to, I think I have a nurturing side that comes out. And I think that kind of comes out with Shannon. Although I think he also carries a lot of weight on his shoulders in terms of past regrets that I think um, probably would be helpful if he let go of. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think he's a little rude in the past. So that's everything I kind of grokked from the 30 minute session that I had. Mm -hmm. voicing shannon that being said his weapon is great mm -hmm. yeah i think the highest rated question i guess was like who do you think is more attractive between them keaton and shannon yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right original keaton like like uh do you know who adam ant is like from yeah. the 80s yeah he totally has that like adam ant rocker vibe like the whole outfit screams he's like in those pleather pants and that like kind of romantic kind of pirate kind of shirt thing i definitely think 
Keaton has the sexier outfit of the two. Shannon, he is very traditional and conservative in his dress. Mm-hmm. Um, he looks like he would win any push-up contest, though. Uh, but I would have to vote for Keaton because he has that like '80s glam rock vibe going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keaton's got a great outfit. New Year's Keaton is adorable too, but, uh, and the art is great. I know it's two different artists. The art is great for both of them, but original Keaton, leather pants, great hair, you know, you can't, you can't beat it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is there a, this might be obvious considering how short the sessions are, but, um, is there any like favorite lines that you have that you remember for both of them or? Sometimes it's hard to remember stuff that isn't that I don't see later on. Like I, I remember moments sometimes where I've done things. Like there was one time I did something in strawberry eggs, and I, this was still I was really new, and it was some big emotional line, and I did it. And like as soon as I did it, like my whole body filled with chills, and Chris was like, "Wow!" And but what I said, no clue. With Keaton, one of the things I mean, it's reminded me because it always pops up. And he's like. I guess. And I say that like that all the time in real life anyway. I never really realized it until I heard it recorded and played back. Um, Yeah. I think Keaton has more memorable lines just because they're funnier. It's hard sometimes when you do so much stuff and I'm, and I have done not done nearly as much stuff as some of my contemporaries, but um, you know, like sometimes I will go to my IMDB page and there'll be a credit for something and I'll have no memory of doing it. And maybe that's part of it is because they probably never told me the real name of the project. One thing I thought was cool is when I was the voice of the dung beetle in um, Hunter Hunter. Right. That will always stick in my mind because my nephew, I couldn't wait to tell him that I was just running on a giant ball of poop and, you know, because he was like five at the time. <laughs> so I was like, my nephew's going to flip his lid when he finds out about this. Mm-hmm. Well, and with how long you were um, involved with Iki Tosin, is there more of a highlight with Koku then? Yeah, that show. Uh, I always loved it how, um, well, first of all, I think that was probably the most adult you know, anime that I had worked on at that point. So seeing like, you know, and I'm sure you know this because I'm sure you've talked to tons of, tons of voice actors who do dubbing, but you know, You'll kind of get a little bit of context from the director. They'll play it through to kind of, so you can kind of see what's happening. And there are so many times in Nikki Joseph where I'm sitting like the scene leading up to like my line. And like there was one scene in, it may have been the very first uh, block of Nikki Tosa, so somewhere in the first like three or four episodes where uh, Hagafu is fighting, um, who is the eye patch? I can't think of her name, but she gets her in a headlock and they cut to this close up of like uh, Hakfu, like peeing her pants, like her panties. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God. So that show was always kind of imprinted on me um, in terms of like, like, wow, you know, like American animation. I never saw anything like that until like DC started doing their movies that went straight to video and, you know, you, there's all this like great violence in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and also I loved how the fact that Koken, you, you almost never saw him fight on camera like he would there would be a fight and it would cut away and then like after the fight he'd be there with his clothes ripped up like <laughs> breathing heavy but you would you'd hardly ever see him fight compared to the women which I thought was really funny mm-hmm. um, and then when we did the projects uh, we did a we did like the last bit of it at um at this uh at the studio what is it called secret headquarters but we did we did like dvd commentary Mm -hmm. so we were kind of talking about all the stuff that happened and you know i remember like when we're going to do the second block of uh ikitosin the producers uh new generation who had originally done the first one they had um a client that and I think the, the, the property changed hands to a, to a different client uh, between like the first set and the second set. And um, 
So New Generation was going to actually fly the leads to Shanghai to record there because it was cheaper for them to fly us to Shanghai and have us record there and then get uh, English speaking locals to do all the secondary parts than it was recording in the US. And then, um, and I got to the point where they, they could do that and they would make barely a profit, like hardly any money. And then they got underbid by someone else. And that's why it got wound up being done in New York or something like that. So I remember we were talking about that, but also in the, in, we did one of the commentaries where I think it was a, it was the movie. It was like, a, I think the last, uh, it was like an hour and a half movie special. And the producer was like, hey, this, um, you know, this movie is so kind of out there compared to the rest of the show. He's like, I think we should just kind of like drink while we watch the DVD commentary, <laughs> while we do the DVD commentary. <laughs> and I was like, all right. So I did it and I'm a lightweight. And, uh, and I remember like just, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I outed myself in a DVD commentary. And uh, I remember like talking about like my great grandmother who liked to drink Scott. I mean, I was blitzed. Those are my memories of Vicky Tosin. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I still actually have a piece of Vicky Tosin merch. I have like the hand towel that came with the DVD box set. Okay. And I use it to cover up my... Um, my audio interface to get, the, <laughs> to get the dust off it. Yeah. But it cracked me up that there was a hand towel included like in the box set of Vicky Tosin. One of one of your more recent anime roles is in uh, Muyo and Roji. What, what, did you want to ask me something particular about it before I ramble at you? No, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> uh, that was something I worked on that um, I had the rare luxury of getting to watch uh, the sub on um, Funimation. Is that right? That was on? It was a Funimation or Crunchyroll. So that never happens where I got to see the whole story and the context and um, the character development. And that's just something you're never privy to. So as a result, the benefit was, um, you know, the director would be like, okay, here's what's going on in the scene. And then I was like, oh yeah, I know. I already, I already watched it. <laughs> a couple times or he'd be or there was one time where it was like no i think what's happening here is this and i'm like well actually no this person da, 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 da. so that helped a lot but also i have a for better or worse i have a particular oral memory so when i hear something i kind of latch onto it even if it's not correct so like, however I was hearing um, Muhyo in the Japanese, I latched onto at least the pronunciation that I understood and it was not what they wanted me to give. So, um, so that was something where like, at the beginning of every session, I would have to like retrain my brain um, how to say a couple words. And then sometimes I would say a word that is a Japanese word that was said in the Japanese. And then I would say it that way and I knew it was the way I heard it. And Jonathan would be like, no, say like how an American would say it. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, okay. Um, so there was, like a, there was uh, some good points and bad points to that. Overall, though, it was luxurious being able to see that much of a story. Because you never get that unless you're doing, you know, American animation where they give you the whole script beforehand. So you can read through the whole, you know, the whole episode and, and see what happens, you know anything else it's it's moment by moment mm -hmm. so and uh what do you think is the um with all the characters you play what do you think is the darkest headspace you've had to go oh, I, I saw you uh, ask that to ben um so there was a game i did castle was the character's name demon gaze demon gaze so this is another instance of like, you know, you go in and, and you just kind of have to go with it. Uh, so at one point in the game, the director gets on with me and he's like, all right, so um, this is after this battle and um, you just find out that the monster you killed was your mom. I was like, okay. <laughs> and then, and it's one of those things where the kind of the, 
for me, kind of what is a, can be challenging is you're in a booth, you have people who are critiquing you, um, you know, you're being paid, you don't want to waste anyone's time. Um, and so sometimes your right brain latches on to wanting to control everything and, uh, you know, like, what can I do to put myself in this space? If you let all that go and just really think about the fact that you might have accidentally killed your mom, um, you know, it just sometimes just kind of happens. So that's kind of, that was probably the darkest thing I had to do. And I guess, I guess the lesson in that is it's like, you know, it gets, it gets challenging when um, you're in a, you're in a situation that's not conducive to the emotion, but you have to kind of just let that go and, and let your natural sense of empathy kick in and do it. And I guess if it can't, because you're so in your head, then you, you kind of have to fake it. <laughs> but hopefully, it, uh, hopefully, um, yeah, you'll be able to be able to let yourself go there. It's um so yeah, that was probably the the biggest curveball that was thrown at me that was like a dark space. I'm sure there were others, but that's the first one that ever that always comes to mind when, when people ask me that. And this is more of a technical question, but with the uh, like little like boy characters that you've done in games or anime, uh, how do you uh, like what's the process of um, how you slip into that? Locally. We always set a kind of a point of reference on our past, um, but technical things that I always try to remind myself of, um, like is one, I always, I always remember to go back, like now that I have nieces and nephews, I have a much more easier reference of like how kids communicate themselves, but also being aware of like how they have less lung capacity than you. So they're gonna take more breaths. And um, sometimes how they, um, their thoughts, I mean, granted this is also kind of on the writing, but the thoughts kind of change rapidly, like moment to moment. And so there's almost that kind of presence that they have. Um, and as far as placement, I mean, like I said, naturally my voice kind of runs on the high range, but it's a little bit of maybe getting a sense of like, I don't know, I'm sure you know who Dino Andrade is. I know he doesn't do a lot of dubbing, but he's one of the wisest, man I've ever met and he's a brilliant teacher and one of the things that he kind of introduced me was the concept of vocal musicality in terms of like where the person places their voice like in their in a, where in their face or in their body and if uh, you know if they elongate certain sounds or if their sounds are more staccato so there's all those kind of technical things that you can do when you're like thinking about kids so it's not just I think necessarily um, pitching up your voice and, and doing stuff, but it's also, I think, there's a little more of a nuance to it, like breath control and where is this kid placed his voice? Is he like, is he a little more nasally or is his voice kind of a little more up in here? So you have those sorts of things to go with. And the more you do it, the more a lot of that stuff you start doing without thinking about it. Um, but vocal musicality is one of those things that I think everyone who is interested in voice acting should develop an ear for because uh, there's a lot of work to be done in voice matching mm -hmm. and having a good sense of vocal musicality will help you get those jobs. And, you know, once you can voice match someone and, and this is an industry where more and more celebrities have been getting involved in animation. So it's like, like, um, like if you are someone who want to become a voice actor and you have an ear for that, that will give you a huge advantage. Like if, if like, you know, a movie comes out I don't know why the movie Trolls is with Justin Timberlake comes into mind, but if you can voice match Justin Timberlake in that movie, um, and I and I remember this because I could at the time, <laughs> and you uh, then you tell your agent, you send your agent a copy of you, know, you voice match and be like, hey, I can voice match this person, and then your agent will know, hey, I can, you know, when this goes to you know, and it's like there could be a an amusement park ride with that voice or, um, you know, a TV spinoff or a, a toy, you could all of a sudden become the go-to person for that. And it's almost like getting free work in a sense. You don't even have to audition for it. Once you kind of are known as the person who can voice, you know, Legolas, mm -hmm. whenever Orlando Bloom doesn't want to do it, you, they call you. Um, 
that is probably people who are passionate about animation. That's the best piece of advice I can give them on top of, you know, learning how to act. But, um, but yeah, having a sense of having that ear. That and also like being able to do creature noises because there's a limited number of people who can do those things and they get a lot of work. Um, and sooner or later, like if you're young, those people are going to retire and they're going <laughs> and uh, they're going to need someone else who can do, you know, dog sounds and, uh, and alien sounds and creature sounds. So. Well, I would think that, uh, maybe the single case where you had to get the lower, the lowest point in your range was uh, the little bit that you did with a subtilizer and sort out online. Oh yeah. And even then that's well, yeah, that was, and then the uh, great tune uh, wound up taking that over. Right. Yeah. There, I, that's not the first time I've um, lost a role because my voice couldn't go that deep, but I think that happened the same year. I was actually going to be someone in three houses oh. and I don't know who it was, but um, I went in there and um and I could not sound as old as I needed to sound. And I, and I certainly, and even if I could, it probably wouldn't have been healthy for me to do that to my voice four hours at a time for however many sessions. So they wound up casting someone else. And I don't know who they cast or who, the, what, like I didn't even get the name of the part because it was, um, you know, they were super secret about it. Um, so I wound up just doing incidentals for that. So it was still like fun, it was good work, but yeah. So that and then Subtilizer, I think that both happened in the same year where I was like, ah, <laughs> but, but yeah, Subtilizer. I was, uh, I was like, once I found out, I was like, oh no, he's gonna be the big <laughs> I was like so pumped. And then I got a call and they're like, you sound too young. We, the client wants you to sound older. And I was like, oh, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, going back to Fire Emblem mode, uh vocally it seems like it's pretty close like shannon and keaton are kind of close to your normal voice just a little bit more affected for both of them yeah keaton's a little more textured and i think his voice is kind of a little more up here and then shannon's voice is a little more kind of placed in the back of my um probably like how i, sh how I shouldn't talk but yeah he's a lot more introspective and i know his voice kind of has a lot more resonance down in here so that's probably one of my like niche bucket list goals that I would like to be at least a fourth character in Fire Emblem Heroes so I can be my whole I can be a whole team mm -hmm. <laughs> so hopefully <laughs> hopefully that'll work out at some point but um yeah they both are I think relatively uh pretty close to where I am vocally which is good especially for games because games even Fire Emblems is not a vocally strenuous game but like most games are like Dan Hibiki Street Fighter Five. That was a that was an intense game to do, and I so I prepared for it. You know, I had to like mm -hmm. we were recording that during um like really really bad fire season here, so okay. the air was terrible, and I had and COVID was also going on, and I had a gas mask that I had from when I was in um long story when I was in Nicaragua, and I it was actually a script job I did because it was like only for a couple weeks. And I was like, I get to go to Nicaragua. And it was at this volcano and they gave me a gas mask for it. And I was so paranoid about um, losing my voice. I stayed inside my apartment. And then when I had to leave to go outside, which I only did to go to the sessions, I would wear the gas mask and I felt like an idiot, but I just didn't want to be in a situation where I blew out my voice and then I had to wait and, and hold, you know, hold, hold, hold production of the game up for my voice to heal. So. And there was a lot of Dan like kicked it up to eleven and five. He was he was excited a lot and yelling a lot. So you gotta take care of you have a very natural deep voice. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so, like when I was your age, my voice was probably like half off higher than it is now. I'm only five seven too, so it usually catches people off off guard. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we're about the same height, and I'm like five eight. When I just when I just talked to Marcel Lentz Pope, um she does Corin and all the Fire Emblem stuff. Um, she said that. Oh yeah. She said, she said that there's always like um, some funny lines in Heroes recording sessions that just like totally catch you off guard, and they never end up using. Yes, 
like if they give you a um, they'll give you a line and they depending on on the on the mood of the session I've done where the one three or two in a row sometimes they they used to be three in a row and now I think sometimes they just want two because that's like how quickly they want to do things but if I get an idea for a slightly better line that's slightly different I'll put that in as the last one just to see but yeah they do they um you know because there's only probably like what like maybe at most 10, mm-hmm. you know, 10, 10, I was going to call them loops, but you're not looping anything, but you know, 10, 10 bytes that you're recording and they probably give you like 12 or 13 and then they wind up picking like the ones that they, I guess they think best fit. Uh, and there probably are some that are pretty good that maybe they put in just to mess with us. If they did that, I would have much respect for them. Corin, man, there's like a lot of alternates for Corin. Right. Like 12 <laughs> or something. Yeah. When they did an alt for Keaton, I thought for sure it'd be Halloween, but um, what would be a good, and they even um, didn't even tell me the holiday when I was doing the Keaton alt, what it was for. Cause they were just, they mentioned like, well, he's gonna have a kite. And I was like doing like holidays in Japan, you know, involving kites. <laughs> but um, he, uh, let me see. Why doesn't Keaton have a swimsuit one? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, this is right. The swimsuit ones are hilarious. Those are actually my favorite ones because they have some of the best lines in them. I'd be down for a, I'd be down for a summer a summer Shannon, but I think probably personality wise, I would say like uh, either like the the one celebrating love uh, that just came out recently. They weren't necessarily Valentine's, right? But it was kind of like family love or stuff like that. Um, Christmas might be good. Oh, and then um, what was the, you know, when Raphael came out and uh, uh, character Stephanie Shea plays, that oh. wasn't around a, a particular holiday, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was. But it was it was an in game holiday. Like it wasn't connected to the to a real world holiday, right? It was like, uh, but I know like everyone had like a sand based weapon. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you when you play the game, like what is your what is your team? Uh, well, all right. I've gotten all, all the characters I have always, I've gotten them all maxed out. One of the things that drives me crazy is, uh, Hegemon Husk Eelguard. She's way too overpowered. Um, so I actually started like respecking all the characters I like with things that will debuff her because it would just drive me crazy if I would have the wrong team in there and then she would just come in and just destroy everybody. I am influenced by sometimes my relationship with the voice actor, <laughs> how well I know them. Yeah. So like Zach Rice is a good friend. So Raphael is maxed out. Um, uh, I don't know Lucian that well, but I do have um, Nesala, like I think maxed out too. I just, cause I, I like the character and, and I like the, the art and the, the crow my last name is a slovak word for like a blackbird so um i think the ones that i don't but the people who i don't know i think i've bowie maxed out i think that was just because i had um i just kept getting a lot of them and then um That's who's the guy who yeah oh oh yeah it is hinata mm-hmm. i like a lot I'm pretty sure that's an alias. Oh, Lou. Uh, but as also goes, I know Michael Johnson. We did we did a series once and I, he's a really sweet guy. Yeah, Eli Wood. He has the Ice Lance. And that is like a Hegemon Husk killer. <laughs> so he's he's someone who I, I'm working on. Oh, and that's Yuri. Yeah. Um I have it with like Panic Smoke, Guard, Swift Sparrow 3, Ruptured Sky. Um, so yeah. I think if I could play another character, I'd want it to be a Tome character or a Staff character. Okay. Yes. I'm going to put that out there. Yeah. What, what, do you, what do you like to play in the game? Or do you have a particular weapon style you like to use? Or I generally default to Beasts sometimes. I'll just play all Beasts. I think all, I mean, they're, they're like really overpowered, but I, all of the like fallen 
or dark versions of characters. Those are really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like um, Fallen. Uh, yeah, Fallen Corn is really strong. Yeah, all the Fallen people are really, really strong. And I like, I like the little Purple Fire like animation on all of them too. That's cool. Yeah, it'd be cool to see Shannon or Keaton have a evil version. Ooh, yes. Fallen <laughs> Shannon. That'd be crazy. Because he's such an inherently good person. Fallen Keaton would kind of make me feel a little sad, but um, <laughs> but yeah, he would look crazy with like the however they animated the purple fire on him. Mm-hmm. I wonder if they do it, they did that video of Fallen Keaton and a Fallen Caden. Oh, Just yeah. To, like have, um, yeah. So I was, I guess, like with the most recent credit on IMDb is uh, doing additional voices on the FF7 remake. Oh yeah, <laughs> I did that. Uh, that here, here's another thing too. Uh, for anyone who wants to get into voice acting, I always tell everyone be nice to everyone. Um, I got that job from I was teaching voice acting at a studio, and um, one of the engineers who was working there, who also um, was getting into voice acting. He was helping out with casting of that. And he he was the one who was instrumental in getting me that job. Um, and I did that like right at the end of the year, I remember. Um, and that was a super, super fun job. But I think almost doing incidentals is probably the most challenging job because when you're like a main, you have one character to focus on, when you start out, you kind of like have that leeway of the first 10 to 15 minutes of like getting a feel for the character's personality. And then, you know, you, you'll go back and re-record it if you need to, to make sure it all kind of sounds consistent. When you're doing incidentals, at least for me, I feel like a strong responsibility to make very distinct choices that are different from each other in terms of how the character sounds and presents themselves. And uh, so it, it's almost like you, it's, it's a little more taxing in a way because you're constantly thinking, okay, now what can I do for this person that's gonna be different from the last person I did? Um, kind of the same way too, when you go in and do, um, when you record uh, some anime and then you'll go in and do like, um, like background voices, sometimes we'll do a background pass if you're not like a main character in it. Mm-hmm. And um, that's one of the trickiest things to do too because you hear all these other voices talking and your job is to not say what they're saying mm-hmm. and say something, you know, and, and also talk in a, in a sound range that is not heard, you know, that, that, that's missing. So you're hearing a bunch of stuff and you're, it's your job to do what you're not hearing. And it's like the reverse of what your brain wants to do. So those are probably the two trickiest like jobs. And I think they're the most underrated or, or underappreciated jobs in voice acting is um, additional voices and um, like background. Mm-hmm. Do you still have much affinity with uh, Aiden and Rune Factory? My niece like made this for me when Rune Factory first came out. Oh, <laughs> and it's it's been uh, on my desk, and then like I was I just hadn't like had a chance to you decorate yet for this room. That was a fun game, and it was something. I it was the first game where like because of all the decisions in that game. You know, I had to marry like seven different people and, you know, have babies with different people. And it was, I was like, that just kind of blew my mind. All the, the myriad of choices, it took like, took a while to record all those, all the different choices, but it was a fun game and I, I really liked doing it. Yeah, my niece really liked it and she made me that like many years ago. Mm-hmm. She's in college now, so that's, oh, how, uh, that's <laughs> how long ago it was. But So is there anything else that's up? Uh upcoming that you're part of that you can safely talk about or no it's you know i get it and i and i and it and also it's annoying i i totally understand that um you know if you have a project you want to have the creative control over it and you want to have the control of the information but sometimes i wish we knew a little bit more about what we we're working on just for ourselves because sometimes we don't i don't even know who i'm who, you know what i'm voicing or anything except what I'm getting in the sessions. I, sometimes I think more information would be conducive to 
doing a better job. It's funny, sometimes, I mean, I, there's one company that's always really good about like email me, like you're allowed to tweet now. Um, and then some people just never tell you. And then I, I, I find out the game's out, you know, like um, when I did uh, X and Teppin, mm, mm-hmm. uh, uh, I didn't know it was coming out. And I went to um, the convention center and it was there. And I was like, like, why didn't anybody tell anybody about this? And I went up and I was like, uh, can, I, you know, can I play the game? And they were like, sure. And then I was like, can I have a t-shirt? And they're like, well, you have to win. I was like, but I'm the voice of the guy. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay, you can have a t-shirt. But I want to, I, but yeah, so I wound up playing Tep in there. But yeah, that's, I kind of feel like I, I wish they were, a lot of companies were more, eager to let the actors help them publicize stuff Mm -hmm. but sometimes yeah they just don't tell you anything and then it's out and they're like oh geez okay but i like teppin a lot until everyone started playing it and then i would lose all the time and then i stopped (laughs) playing it when it first came out i thought it was pretty good and then like 24 hours later when everyone started playing it i just get trounced Mm -hmm. were you uh before getting into it were you like a fan of anime at all i when i grew up there was um battle of the planets Mm -hmm. which i loved as a kid growing up and then i never really got into speed racer and i think mostly because it just didn't involve giant robots and you know that kind of stuff uh and then robotech came out after that so I was in the anime and into the series. And of course, like when um, Akira came out, I watched that. And I think it, the first time I watched it, you know, I was like in high school and I had no idea what was going on. So I certainly didn't have like the volume of content that's available to people today. So I was into it from like the limited amount of like um, material that I could consume. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I remember when I got, first of all, it's so funny. When I got my first dubbing job, it never even occurred to me that like I could pursue that as a career, like until I got the job. I was like, oh yeah, like people do this and make money. Um, otherwise, I probably would have like tried to engage with it sooner in my in my life. Um, so I mean, that being said, like I have you know I have subscriptions to you know Funimation and Crunchyroll and all those things, and so I've been watching. And, and I'm one of those people, too, who I get into a show and I will just watch it constantly and then something will interrupt my life and then I'll forget and then I need to get back on. So, like, I was watching My Hero Academia and mm-hmm. then I stopped because I wound up having to leave town and I need to go back and pick that up. And uh, the main character, I mean, it's it's a well-written and, and I love the voice for it. Um, it's just a very, he has a very, like, pure and honest quality to his voice Mm -hmm. that I like so and I like how his version of the abilities are different from uh, um, All Might's so yeah that's a good one yeah I thought there was something else I was watching too though that was a little more dark but yeah for me it's really uh and for a lot of people too but I don't know maybe if it wasn't for certain anime series I'm not sure if it would have made me feel like comfortable with realizing that I was gay growing up so yeah um yeah i didn't have that (laughs) growing up uh i mean yeah i I, and i think um i like that there's a lot more visibility of of those things like i remember obviously this technically is an it is an anime it's american made but you know when i was watching avatar which I like if I meet any friend who has not watched Avatar The Legend of Korra, I kind of force them to watch it because I just think it has so many beautiful storytelling points in it. And it covers a lot of things about love and um, the uh, and then the last scene in Korra, which I did not see coming, you know, where, where you know, uh, Korra and uh, uh, what's her name? Anyway, so they kind of shows like Korra's you know, bi or something like that. I was like, 
I was so pumped that that was on a Nickelodeon show. I'm glad, it makes me glad that that material is out there now because uh, I can't think of anything that I had growing up that kind of helped me come to terms with my sexuality or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I have, you know, heard stories about, you know, people saying like, oh yeah, this character or this or that. I don't know if I've done any characters that have helped people. If I did, that'd be awesome. But off the top of my head, I can't think of any. But I'm glad that like that's kind of that's where storytelling storytelling is going. Right. Um, you know, it shows a wide, you know, because it often just kind of just gets confined to like one group's perception of the world, and that's just not how things are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, some people were, I was, as people in the sub and, uh, me too, or would you be willing to do some like specific funny lines as Shannon and Keaton? If I like, yeah. Okay. I'll just type them out here. Fruity pebble ice cream. We don't have that in the mountains. <laughs> so will you share your fruity pebble ice cream with me? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so my final question is always asking, uh, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh, geez, I don't know. It's, um, I mean, in a lot of ways, I am happy with what I've done so far. I mean, I didn't think, um, I mean, obviously, Here's another thing I always tell everybody too, like if you want to get into voice acting, you will be much, much more successful if you view yourself as a business person first. Um, the people who view themselves as business people work more often than people who view themselves as artists or actors or storytellers because it's like 90% running your own business. So that being said, I, I've had my moments where I've been good at that and moments where I have not. Um, I'm. Like if, if I were to die tomorrow, hopefully that wouldn't happen. But um, the fact that I've been like, you know, I, I've had three or four characters I can name, you know, like X, Habiki, Keaton, Shannon. The fact that I've been four characters with varying degrees of, you know, uh, notoriety or, or that people know. Um, that's probably a lot more than I thought I'd ever do. Um, like I never saw, I never thought in a million years I'd be the voice of Dan Hibiki, let alone Mega Man X, mm -hmm. let alone like get involved in a franchise that has such a strong and um, uh, like powerful and, and, and welcoming fan base to the Fire Emblem series. So for that, I'm, I'm very grateful. And uh, hopefully I'll continue to do more jobs that will you know, that I'll be proud of and that people will like. Um, but, geez, you know, no matter what you do in a hundred years from now, no one's really gonna know. Uh, so I think it's honestly, the, m the more I can do to positively impact a person's life, you know, whether that is, you know, getting, helping them get an agent or, or just being a good listener, or giving some advice, that's more important to me than um, being famous or booking you know, or, or being the, you know, like, it, like, would I love to be the voice of Spider Man? Yes. I have been, sounds strong to say, but I have been in love with Spider Man. <laughs> this is, like when I was a kid, I had a the equivalent of a Barbie doll that was Spider Man mm -hmm. that I took with me everywhere. He was like I don't know my imaginary big brother or something. So yes, like as a career high, if I was the voice of Spider Man in anything, that would be a huge bucket list thing for me. But at the end of the day, you know, like I said, like a hundred years from now, like I'll be one of like many many lucky people who got to voice Spider Man or voice. X, but I think at the end of the day, it's just how you treat other people. And if I leave and there are people behind, he said, this person helped me, 
that would that would be enough for me. Well, thank you. I'm glad that we got to do this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and um, yeah, let me know. Uh, I'd like to check out your subreddit. If okay, you, uh, don't mind. If I'm allowed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, send me that info. Yeah, I'll be sure to. Uh, and of course, once other once I have the video, I'll, I'll send it to you as well. Cool. All right. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Take care.